for the, the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to be talking about my work on DNA metapart coding. So hopefully this won't be too technical, but of course I'm happy to answer questions at any point and especially in the end. So um, first of all, for those of you who have never heard of CBU, CBU is a research center within the University of Porto. It is located close to Vila do Conte, which is a small town north of Porto, which is the second largest uh, city in Portugal. The center itself is located in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by cornfields and eucalyptus plantations. But if we zoom close enough, we can see that we even have a swimming pool. So it's a perfect location for, <laughs> for work. Uh, we are around 350 people, a bit about which half are PhD and master students of CBO's BioDiv uh, program. And many of our researchers are, and students are actually not Portuguese, which means that we have a very diverse and international environment in our center with people working on very different subjects from adaptation of animals to desert environments, to genomics of coloration, biomechanics of scorpions, and et cetera, et cetera. The other good thing that we have is, uh, besides the pool, of course, is the very nice lab facilities where researchers, lab technicians, and students can do most of their molecular work. So currently, I'm a member of two research groups, one focused on bat ecology and the other on general aspects of applied ecology. And a lot of things I'll be presenting here today were, of course, done with their help and collaboration. So, of course, all of these that I'll be showing one was not done by me alone. So I entered CBU as a master's student, and for my thesis, I was working with bird parasites and trying to compare bird parasite communities between Northwest Iberia and Northwest Africa. And at the time, we found some nice results in which parasite communities seem to be shaped mostly by the bird community itself but also that things like host specific lineages were less likely to cross the strait and occur in both areas, even if the host did occur in both, and like host generally species that were mostly like cosmopolites. And another thing we found because we were working with three different uh, primer sets is that often individuals were harboring more than one parasite lineage. And Although like in most cases, you could detect the double infection. So at the time, of course, we were working with Sanger sequences. You could see like every now and then you would have double peaks, which would mean like there's a two parasite lineages occurring in a host. And sometimes it was not as easy as this case and you would have like a mess of sequences going on. And it was not very easy to like to disentangle one lineage from the other or trying to get something out of this. So in 2013, when I was given the chance to work with free-tailed bats and my supervisors were interested in analyzing its diet, they told me actually that the idea would be also to look at chromatograms and try to disentangle different prey items. And I thought like, no way, this is going to be like impossible task. So I started reading as much as I could like on molecular diet analysis. And although at the time the literature was not that extensive, there were already like a couple of papers on bat diets using like metabar coding approaches. So we were lucky enough that at the same time, our institute had just received an Illumina platform. So when I proposed like going forward with this work with metabar coding, we thought like it was a great plan. So to give you a little background information on these species, they are distributed mostly around the Mediterranean basin and they're fast flyers flying up to 130 kilometers per hour. And they have these like very long and pointy wings to forage in open spaces, usually around like 200, three meters high. Uh, but sometimes they can fly at altitudes up to like 600, um, 1600 meters. So they can fly like really, really high. And from the literature, what we knew was that there were supposed to be moth specialists, sometimes feeding a bit on Neuroptera. However, like the taxonomic resolution in the analysis of moth fragments present in feces due to their soft body and lack of taxonomic characters, it, it prevented like any further analysis that we wanted to do because like all we knew was, was 
they were eating moths, and that's it. So our goals were to understand if me, males and females were eating the same prey, but also if juveniles and adults were eating, eating different things and how the diet changed or not throughout the season. So we captured free-tailed bats and they, they roost like in these big and tall uh, bridges. So you can see them like hanging here in a crevice. These crevices like go along uh, the entire bridge. So we just set up these like poles hanging um, down the bridge. And you can see that there's like mist nets here. So when bats come out, they get trapped uh, in the net. And then we uh, pit tagged all the bats. We sexed and aged them, collected uh, tissue samples, and of course, uh, fecal samples. So for metabarcoding analysis, we pretty much followed what was being done at the time. So we amplified the small C1 fragment using the zeal primers, and we extracted DNA from a single pellet of each individual. In total, we had 143 individuals distributed from five different bridges and that were collected between April and October. So what did we get? Well, as before, like with morphology, we can see that like most of the diet is composed by Lepidoptera, but we also found like more insect orders. So in total, we found five different insect orders being consumed, distributed across 17 different families, and over 100 uh, species were detected. So we surely gained a lot by doing this um, molecular approach. We then tried to assess if the prey composition varied among pre our predefined groups. And what you can see here is that we found significant differences in prey composition between males and females, but not between seasons or age categories. So we were interested in trying to understand which prey items were causing these differences between males and females. So we explored this a bit more. And here you can see like the frequency of occurrence of each of these prey, prey items in females and males. And you can see that like these prey over here, they seem to occur more frequently in females, while these ones over here a bit more on males. And by looking at these species, actually you can start seeing a pattern, which is these species are large migratory moths, while these ones seem to be smaller and non-migratory species. So we tested this further and tried to understand whether these uh, size and migration were really uh, different between males and females. And you can see that yes, average prey size of females is larger than of males. And also like the proportion of migratory moths seem to be higher in females than in males. So we found gender related segregation on the diet of these bats. This is most likely linked to the high energetic costs of pregnancy and lactation. And actually what would we hypothesize is that females are probably hunting at higher altitudes, taking advantage of migratory moths that are rich in lipids for their migration and thus highly profitable prey. Furthermore, we could only detect these patterns because of the high resolution offered by DNA metabar coding and the fact that most moth species in Europe have been sequenced and thus we could infer their sizing and behavior. Unfortunately, like some of Many analyses that we'd like to do, they're not possible for other groups because we don't have enough DNA barcodes out there. So after this study, we were very happy, but <laughs> we were also uh, started having a lot of questions. So we started wondering how good was our sampling? Is like one pellet per individual enough? What would like five, 10, 15 pellets tell us? Because bats, when they poop inside a bag, they leave a lot of pellets, not just one. And also we wanted to know if we pull this, the pellets in, instead of analyzing them individually, what would be the effect? And we couldn't find any information on the effects of sampling procedure in molecular dietary analysis. So we decided to explore this in, in more detail. So we came up with an experiment where we sampled uh, 20 bats. Uh, we extracted DNA from 15 individual pellets. And then we also uh, added a pool of 15 pellets. So we selected bats basically that produced more than 30 pellets each. 
and then we individually extracted 15 and pulled the other 15. And we then did three PCR replicates of these 16 samples, let's say. And the idea was trying to understand what should we replicate, individuals, pellets, or PCRs. And we were also, of course, interested in understanding the effect of pulling samples before DNA extraction. So what we found is actually that most of the variation in diet composition comes from individuals. And this is, of course, followed by pellets and then PCR replicates. And what is most surprising to me is that like the variance between um, individuals is 15 times higher than the variance um, between pellets, which in turn is like 12 times higher than the variance between PCR replicates. So when you do a PCR replicate, you're mostly recovering the same uh, species composition, which is completely distinct uh, from doing a different pellet of the same bat uh, or like sequencing a different bat. We also conducted a bunch of simulations in which we randomly subsampled the number of pellets that we analyzed. And what we could observe is that the error in the frequency of occurrence decreased not only with the number of pellets analyzed, but also with the frequency of occurrence within the individuals. So for example, if a certain prey is present in only one of the 15 samples, you will need to analyze a lot of uh, pellets until you reach like the true frequency of occurrence in your population. Um, but if you have a prey species that is present in all the 15 pellets, um, that means like you only need like three or four pellets until you reach the true frequency of occurrence. So what about pools? Uh, in this plot, you can see that you have here the 15 pellets uh, individually, uh, one random pellet, and then our pool, and what we can see is that the number of prey species recovered between the pool and one random pellet is basically the same. So we recover on average the same number of species from a pool than from random pellets. And at, the, at this time, we got like really confused why this was happening. Like how can 15 pellets have or a pool of 15 pellets have the same number of species than a random pellet, while the sum of 15 individual pellets has a much higher species richness. Um, so at this point, we thought like, okay, maybe this has to do with, with sequencing depth and we need to increase our sequencing depth. But when we, we increased like the sequencing depth, like we went from 5,000 reads to 80,000 reads, you could see that it's, still pretty much the same. Like the number of species recovered um, in a pool is not different from uh, any random pellet. So basically we found that pools are equal to any random pellet. And we tried to further understand what exactly the pools were detecting. And it seems that they're mostly detecting what is frequent within individuals. So if a certain prey species is present in all pellets, there's a high chance it will be detected in the pool. On the contrary, if it's present in only one or two uh, of the pellets, uh, then there's a high chance it won't be detected in the pool. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. What we are observing here is like a dilution effect. So uh, maybe in that one pellet, this spray actually uh, corresponds to 50% of the DNA in there. But when you sum all the 15 pellets and it doesn't occur in any other pellet, it means that in the end, in the pool, it will only correspond to maybe 1% of the DNA. Uh, so it makes sense that you observe this dilution, which makes rare species disappear in the pools. So um, the detectability of species in pools depends on the frequency of occurrence within individuals. And we try to further see if okay, this was a problem only for rare species of it. And maybe common species would be like uh, properly um, 
found in pools. So here you have the plots uh, for rare species, common species, and very common species, and the comparison between pools and individual pellets. And this is like the mean error in, uh, in the estimation of the frequency of occurrence. And you can see that pools are always above um, the individual pellets. So the error is always higher. And even for very common species, like the error in estimating the frequency of these species is basically the same as analyzing one random pellet. So you really don't gain anything by pooling your samples before DNA extraction. And actually, if you sequence like um, two or three individual pellets, you're already like decreasing your error in frequency of occurrence estimates. So basically, one pool equals one pellet. So to wrap up, individuals have most of the variation. More pellets give more information for each species about each individual. Population frequency of occurrence error decreases with the number of pellets used and the frequency of occurrence within individuals. And pools seem to equal one random pellet and depend of species frequency of occurrence within individuals. And that's it. So we then got a bunch of new questions. <laughs> like before, we felt like we answered some of our mythological questions, but because we were interested in working not only with strictly insectivorous species, uh, we wondered what would happen if we tried to study the diet of generalist species. Um, we would probably need to use multiple primers for the different components of the diet but we were not quite sure how the different results um, would be among them in terms of prey diversity and composition, as well as if our molecular approach would miss or overrepresent some prey in comparison, for example, to morphological analysis. So as model system, we use the black wheat here when Owenant leucuda. Just to give you a bit of background on this species, it is a highly territorial species in which males actively defend their territory, kicking out any intruders. They also spend a lot of time singing, signaling to other individuals that like this is their space. Um, it is mainly an insectivore, but can sometimes also feed on wild berries and small reptiles. So we captured over 100 individuals and collected their droppings. Uh, using um, these uh, spring traps. Uh, the spring traps are baited with mealworms and then birds come to, to get the mealworms and the trap closes. Um, we then uh, used four different molecular markers targeting different genes. And we also did morphological identification of the prey remains. We then analyzed the diet considering each marker individually and by combining them into a unique data set and compare the results of the different approaches. So looking at plants first, we can see here that overall we detected a much higher number of occurrences um, using molecular techniques. Most of these occurrences were identified at uh, family and genus level. Um, while using morphology, many of the taxa was actually identified using species. So you can see that morphology is here in gray, and then like the two different markers are here represented with different colors. And then like the sum of the, the, the molecular markers is represented in dark gray. So you can see a lot of identifications here with morphology at species level, and then with molecular methods, only family and genus. But this was expected because the markers that we used, like TRNL and 18S, they don't have that much uh, taxonomic resolution. Um, we, what we can also see uh, is that molecular methods detected a much higher diversity of taxa than morphology. So you can see like many different orders of plants here being detected with both primers, while with morphology, we detected all, mostly like this plant here, solanalis, um, and not much of anything else. So, Taking into account what we know about the behavior of these species, it's almost impossible, I would say with very high confidence, that the birds are eating all these different prey. So they are known to eat mostly berries, and most of these plants do not actually 
produce any fleshy fruits. So I cannot imagine these birds eating like most of these plants would be impossible for them to eat. So most of the plants detected using DNA metabar coding are probably the result of secondary detection. So these plants were consumed by the insects that they were consuming, um, except for a few like situations where you actually detected true uh, plants, um, consumed plants. So moving on to animals, um, the overall findings were fairly similar with a few important differences. Uh, we can see that this time using morphology, um, most of the occurrences were described at either family or order level, or sometimes even higher taxa. While with molecular methods, we have a lot of identifications of species, genus, and family level. And we can see that there seems to be some differences also between primers. So ZBJ, uh, so the C1 primer is often detecting a lot of things at species level, while 16S seems to be detecting or identifying things mostly to family and genus. And this is most likely related to differences in representation in databases. So you don't have the same number of species sequenced for 16S as you have for, for C1. Now, when we look at the composition um, using um, both approaches, you can see um, that now morphology and molecular results seem to be a little more congruent with major groups occurring with both methods. So we have spiders here, we have some coleoptera here being detected with both um, methods. We have uh, Imenoptera also here detected with both methods, but we also have some differences. Like for example, Diptera, especially with ZBJ, uh, you can see that it's mostly this blue bar over here that's driving this difference, is detecting a lot of Diptera and a lot of Lepidoptera, which at morphology you don't see that much. Um, so there seems to be some contrasting results in here. And you can see that this seems to be driven mostly by ZBJ because for the other primers, there's not that much difference between morphology and molecular, except perhaps here for Toptra, where you have a lot of detections even with uh, 16S and not that much uh, with morphology. So we seem to have like, um, primer bias situation uh, where morphology seems to be fairly similar to 18S and 16S, but not so much with ZBJ. Um, so this uh, CO1 marker is failing to detect some taxa. For example, Hymenoptera here, you can see the blue bar is quite low here. So it's not detecting almost Hymenoptera at all, while it's detecting a lot of other things, which from the morphological perspective, almost don't even occur in the diet. So Lepidoptera and Diptera clearly dominating uh, the amplifications of uh, CO1. So wrapping up, in this case, a metabar coding proved anyway to be a powerful tool, but when assessing the diet of a generalist species, single markers can give us biased views of the diet, and we need extra careful interpretation of dietary items possibly complemented with other methods like behavior observation and morphological identification of feces in order to be sure whether some taxa is really being predated or is the result of secondary detection. Now, as we found these cool differences between um, before for male and female bats, we were also interested in checking if the same thing happened with these birds. And another thing that we were interested is whether these differences would only be detected if analysis were done at the species or OT level, disappearing at family or order level, which is what you can usually reach with morphology. And in fact, what we found was that like males were feeding on a higher diversity of prey items, so OTUs or species, than females. But when you repeat the analysis at family level, these differences uh, disappear. So, um, Probably um, this happens because like uh, uh, males, they have a higher um, mobility uh, within their territory. So they're probably coming into contact with a higher diversity of prey items. Nevertheless, these prey items correspond to the similar 
uh, functional uh, groups, let's say. So they belong to the same families that they all uh, eat. So although males are capturing a wider range of prey species, from a functional perspective, they're feeding on the same type of prey as females. We also tested for differences in diet composition. And again, we found differences between males and females, this time not only in terms of species and OTUs, but also of families. So here we plotted like the frequency of occurrence of each prey item um, and between males and females. And the, these green links represent the prey items which differed significantly between males and females. And the most obvious difference, of course, is here for Miside. And actually, it, it showed a much higher proportion in females than in males. So females were like 58% of females were feeding on ants, while only 29% of males were feeding on ants. And this is likely related to, to foraging behavior. So while uh, females are most likely foraging closer to the nest, while males spend most of their time moving and defending their territory, and ants are highly predictable and abandoned and easy to catch prey uh, for the females. So it makes sense that if she has to do these short trips just to feed herself and go back to the nest and warm up the eggs, it makes sense that she goes for these uh, predictable and easy um, prey source. So after this um, successful yet challenging <laughs> experiments, we then tried to apply our knowledge on a somewhat like more complex and real world uh, problem. So as you might know, birds and bats can be quite widespread in agroforest landscapes. And many studies have actually pointed to their overall negative effects on the abundance of arthropods across multiple agricultural systems. However, one thing that is often not clear with these studies is how individual species contribute to this service, nor how it varies seasonally, which can have important consequences on management and conservation decisions. And a way to disentangle this, so the the contribution of each species to the overall community um, service is by the means of ecological networks. So by studying this, the species position within the network as, as well as the overall network, network structure, one can get a deeper insight into the ecological role of species and their functional role in ecosystems. For example, by looking at the modularity of the network, we can see in, in how many units the provided service is divided, or by looking at the centrality um, of the species, we can infer its importance in the community. Combined with powerful tools like DNA metabarcoding uh, that can offer species level resolution to dietary items, ecological networks can provide a key understanding of species roles in the provision of ecosystem services. So now I'm going to present you two practical case studies on how we can use ecological networks and metabar coding to better understand predator pest interactions. One of the studies focuses on a community of bats while the other focuses on a community of birds. And so for the bats, we conducted like a special and temporal restricted sampling in order to identify the roles that different species play in pest consumption. We wanted not only to describe the overall predation on arthropod pests, but also produce a network and assess the species role in the network. Finally, we wanted to understand the functional complementarity and redundancy across species in order to identify key species for the service. As for birds, uh, we also con conducted a spatial restricted sampling, but in this uh, case, we conducted also seasonal sampling. So every month, uh, this time, in order to describe seasonal variation in the predation of arthropod pests, produce seasonal predator pest networks, and describe seasonal changes in network properties. So, for bats, sampling was made um, in northeast Portugal within the Sabor uh, Riven Basin. Uh, we captured almost 500 individual bats belonging to 19 different species. And plus, we collected over 100 fresh fecal pellets from known roosts, this way extracting DNA from over 1,200 uh, droppings. 
We then uh, use two CO1 primers, DBJ and FWH2, to uh, amplify the insect DNA present in the feces. For birds, sampling was also conducted in Northeast Portugal, but this time uh, at the catchment area of the Tua River. So we have four sampling sites that were sampled every month. Um, in total, we captured 50 different bird species uh, and over 2,600 droppings were collected and their DNA extracted. And this time we used only FWH2 uh, primer sets to get the um, insect DNA. So moving on to results of bats. Overall, we found that predation levels differed among bat species. Uh, for example, almost all of the individuals of long-eared bats uh, predated um, at least one pet spe species. And actually like 50% of its diet is composed by pest species. In comparison, other species like Miotis imaginatus uh, almost had no predation of insect pests. So overall, bats in our community predated on at least 132 different pest species belonging to 47 different families and eight insect orders. Tipula oleracea was the most predated pest, followed by noctuids, uh, noctopranuba, agrotis stegetum, and notographa gamma, all species commonly found in bat diet. And finally, also Tamatopeia pitiocampa, the prostitutionary moth, and Praesolei, the olive moth. And this makes sense because our landscape where we sample the bats is a matrix of um, forest remains uh, with pine trees and other, other uh, trees, but also a lot of olive groves and many different kinds of um, agricultural cultures. So it makes sense that the most common species being predated are mostly like polyphagous species or then like pine trees or olive trees uh, species. So this is our um, bat pest interaction. Here you have the network and here you have the matrix. We found that our network was modular and bats were actually clustered in six different groups here represented with different uh, colors. So the same here in the matrix. Um, each of these module or cluster was associated to pests belonging to different orders of insects. So for example, you have here this purple group feeding mostly on Lepidoptera uh, pest species, while this um, red group, which refers to the central group here, is feeding also a lot on Lepidoptera, but also on a lot of Diptera and so on. Regarding species roles in the network, most of our species were peripherals, meaning they're, that they're not either connecting the different models nor contributing to the cohesion of the models or the overall network. Still, we have two species here, like really on the borderline, but still Miniopterus and Iposiderus were identified as model hubs, meaning that each is a strong representative of its cluster. Yet, the species with highest centrality scores were Pipistrellus pipistrellus, Rhinolophus ferromechinum, and Minioterus triversi, exhibiting not only the higher number of connections or prey, but also a higher proximity to other bat species and a higher connecting role of the different models. Also, um, network nestedness and specialization was found to be lower than what would be expected if species interactions were simply a reflection of their abundance. And this means that the diet of specialist species is not entirely contained within that of generalists, and that our network is dominated by generalist species with a few specialist species feeding on unique pests. So our like specialist species, they are not eating a subset of what our generalist species are eating. They're eating something distinct. We don't have a lot of um, specialist species, but the ones we do, they're eating distinct uh, prey. So finally, we simulated bat extinctions in order to see how the number of regulated pest species would drop. So 
Each triangle here represents an extinction of a bat species and the color reflects its conservation status. And the y-axis, we can see the percentage of regulated pest species as we go like along the number of accumulated extinctions. And what you can see is that this curve takes a long time to drop. Um, so uh, this means that there's a high functional redundancy in our system. And in fact, like up to 60% of the pests can be regulated by only three bats. And that's Pipistrellus pipistrellus, Rhinolophus ferromechino, and Rhinolophus euryale. And we can increase this uh, regulation level up to 75% if we include another three species of bats. Um, however, this scenario of like bats going extinct, depending on how useful they are in terms of like how, how much they interact with pest species is very unlikely. A more realistic scenario would be to extinct species according to their conservation status. And in that case, it will be this curve over here. And what you can see is that there's a significant and accelerating decline in pest control services compared to a random scenario that although not very strong is then the less significant. And in that case, you would need like almost three times more species in also to regulate the same 60% of the pests. Now, moving on to birds, pasteurization levels were much more even across different species than what we observed with bats. On average, birds interacted with pests 55% of the times. And actually, like the number of samples with pest species was or seems to be a response to the number of samples tested rather than anything else. So for species that we have a lot of samples, we also have a lot of samples with pests. And there seems like to be a really linear trend. But you can also think that if our sampling represents what is in the community, because we are using misnets in a standardized way, we are not like using calls to attract certain species. You can like expect that if one species is more captured and then you have more samples than other, it's because it's more abundant in your, in your site. So what it seems to be is that like the most abundant species are the ones that are actually more interesting for pest control. And the only two exceptions or the kind of exceptions here would be um, this uh, swallow, Delicon urbica, which seems to predate a little bit more on pests than, than the, the remaining species, as well as Philoscopus troculus, which also seems to predate a bit more on, on pests. Now, if we look at the most consumed insect pests, we can see that there's a strong seasonal variation associated to each, to each species. So some species are being predated like mostly in winter and spring, others peak like in March, others peak in November, and you have, you have a lot of variation going on here. And in fact, this pattern seems to expand to the entire community. So, <laughs> Here you have an MD and MDS. Sorry, I need some water. Okay. So here we have our plot, our points. Each point represents a site of the month. And what you can see is like, this is the initial point when we started sampling in, in, in April. And the community keeps changing in all locations in a similar way and in a circle of path that after one year of sampling basically ends up where we first started. So basically we have a cyclical and gradual shift in pest consumption, probably associated with, of course, insect phenology. And it's really funny to see this like circular repetitive um, pattern in all the, the four sampling sites. So 
Finally, we wanted to take a look at network metrics associated uh, with the uh, bird pest interactions. And we can also observe a strong seasonal variation in the metrics. Sorry. So we found very strong um, patterns in M modularity. So medularity was very high uh, during spring and summer when birds are reproducing and, and species are much more like compartmentalized. And it was lowest in autumn and winter, indicating a much more homogeneous community that is mostly sharing resources. We can also observe that there was a peak in pest diversity in uh, November, indicating a much more homogeneous, um, uh, indicating, uh, sorry. So we observed this very high peak of pest richness in autumn. There was not accompanied by a higher bird richness. And thus this led to an overall higher niche overlap in November, lower specialization and lower modularity. <laughs> so to conclude, DNA network coding combined with ecological networks constitute a valuable framework to study pest control services by insectivorous vertebrates, allowing not only to identify potential candidate target species for conservation by control, but also allowing a deeper understanding of predator pest interactions and dynamics. And that's it. I'm happy to take questions or be contacted by email if you think about it something in the future and um that's it <laughs> <laughs>